Good morning. It is good to see you all today. It's good to be back in my home church. I'm not saying I'm not here very often in my travels, but they made me park in guest parking. But anyway, I'm here. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. You'll see some very familiar verses beginning in verse 9. And here, I'm here to remind you, and ultimately I'm reminding myself, and you can listen in, that God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say oh me, and I'll give you a minute. You okay? All right. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Jesus gives us a model for prayer, and here's what it says. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then our key verse for today, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Will you pray with me as we keep our Bibles open? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, thank you for the good news of salvation that has overcome the bad news of brokenness that we see all around us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our all-sufficient prophet, priest, and king. Thank you for his atoning blood, which satisfies your righteous wrath against our sin and guilt. Open our eyes, Lord, that we might behold wondrous things from your word, and we pray based on the name of our Savior, Jesus, who even gives us the right to call upon you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Now, this verse is so foreign to our thinking that, folks, I need you to know that we need it today. We need it today. See, the question we have to ask as we consider this verse is, what is the place of a God-centered faith in your life? For many, faith is like a very important room in your home that you never go in. For some, faith is such a private matter that life can go on without God's intervention easily, and we don't even notice it. For others, faith is not centered on God at all, but in institutions, strategies, and individual willpower. Let me ask you, when was the last time you prayed for daily bread? You see, much of our modern life pushes us away from the truth of this verse. In fact, I got an illustration of it yesterday when I was in the grocery store, and I made the mistake of turning down the cereal aisle. An abundance of choices on every shelf filling up a whole aisle. It's overwhelming, almost like sensory overload. Now, you might have a particular loyalty to a certain cereal and another. I'm not here to to campaign for any of them. The point is this, to read here, God give us this day our daily bread, and then walk down an aisle like that, it's almost disconcerting, isn't it? See, this verse is in sharp contrast to the way people live their lives in our day. The world needs this verse. Our nation needs this verse. Our community needs this verse. And guess what? You and I, we need this verse. In Matthew 6, 9 through 13, also found in Luke chapter 11, we have the model prayer. It's given to us by the Lord Jesus And he says to us, when you pray, pray like this. The content of it is very simple, but yet it is profound. We are to recognize God as the source of our lives. He says, our Father who's in heaven. We are to honor God in his name and reputation. Hallowed, holy is his name. We are to seek God's kingship and authority over all of life. Your kingdom come, it says. And we rightly should petition 
the Lord for provision and forgiveness and deliverance. This model prayer is to teach us how to approach God in prayer. It teaches us the proper place of faith. It should be the center of our lives, not the suburb of our lives. And throughout this model of prayer, God occupies the place of authority. In fact, verse 11 is kind of a pivot point. I'm not sure if you noticed it. The first three petitions, verse 9 and 10, teach us to pray, addressing God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. And it says, your name, Lord, your kingdom, your will. And then in verse 11, it pivots to speak to us and, and our needs, addressing our need for bread, for forgiveness, for deliverance. Now, this transition from you to our, this transition from God's name, fame, and will is not a change of subject at all. It is not su to suggest that when we pray, we some how change seats on the bus with the Lord. At some point we pray to him and his authority and then we change seats and we start to think about our own needs. No, as a pastor friend of mine put it this way, he said, when we pray about God's name and kingdom and will, we're expressing our devotion to God. And when we pray for bread, forgiveness and deliverance, we are expressing our dependence upon God. Even when our needs become the subject of our prayers, God remains the object of our prayers. So when we move from praying about God's kingdom to praying about our kitchens, we're still praying God's priorities. And you know the amazing thing that this verse teaches us? It teaches us, this model prayer teaching us, teaches us that to make, when we make God's priorities our own in the process, we realize that we are one of his priorities. So much so that in this model prayer, he calls upon us to ask him for daily bread. Again, I say, God will take care of you. See, I want you to know that the God of the hallowed name, coming kingdom, and sovereign will is also the God of daily bread. Bread. In fact, Matthew 6, 8, just before this, teaches us that God knows what we need even before we ask Him. And so when we pray, we're not trying to talk God into doing something He doesn't want to do. In fact, we're also told in this chapter, down in verse 32, that God will, be, will indeed provide for our needs. Verse 33 even goes on to say that if we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, all these things that we worry about will be added to us. God will take care of you. See, the implications of this prayer is that we're to live in light of God's divine provision. It comes from our heavenly Father. Every word of this verse, verse 11, is important. And it teaches us two very important things. When I was a young student in seminary many years ago, I won't tell you how long it was, but it was uh, back in the 20th century. I was uh, in training with... Uh, pastor on staff at his church, and sometimes uh, the young students would get the opportunity over lunch to ask the pastor questions. He called us his young embryonic theologues. Took me about three semesters to figure out what that meant. But anyway, we would gather with him, and sometimes the students would, would ask him questions. One question I'll never forget it. One of the students asked, well, pastor, how many points should a sermon have? And he said, at least one. For you today, I've got two. You see, verse 11, give us this day our daily bread, teaches us two very important things. To pray this, first of all, is to acknowledge your dependence upon the Lord. It is to acknowledge your dependence upon the Lord. It says here, give us this day our daily bread. Bread. Daily bread is food that we need day by day to survive. Praying, give us this day our daily bread, then therefore forces us to acknowledge that bread doesn't automatically show up on our table. God provides for our needs. God will take care of you. At the same time, when it speaks of bread here, we also have to understand that he's talking about all of our physical needs. Bread represents what food produces, strength and stamina and ability and good sense that sometimes seems to be in short supply in the day in which we live. It symbolizes all of our physical needs. Bread gives us the stamina to close the business deal. It 
keeps our minds clear to think and to plan. Bread stands for the car that gives us basic transportation or money to get on the bus. It provides for us, praise the Lord, in the south, air conditioning that we can actually sit here comfortably. It's part of God's physical provision for us. Give us this day our daily bread. It's speaking of God's daily physical provision for us, what we need. And when you pray, give us this day our daily bread in our modern day, you know that that's actually offensive. That's actually offensive to people today. You know why? Because it's humbling. It's humbling. It's humbling to admit that bread comes from a source outside of ourselves. That if bread is not provided, we will die. In praying this, we acknowledge that we need divine provision. And when we pray this verse, we are confessing our humanity. It admits, we have to admit that we're not self-sufficient. Give us this day our daily bread forces us to deal with the fact that we need the Lord. And our physical needs are met because God keeps putting bread on our table. Go ahead work hard, but understand God is the one who meets your needs. Save money and plan wisely, yes, indeed, but God is the one who meets your needs. Don't, don't forget that. Don't forget that you need God. You need divine provision to get into heaven. You also need divine provision to get up in the morning for the physical strength and provision in your life. We need the Lord. To pray for daily bread covers all of our physical and material needs, and it says that we ought to pray. If that is true, then we ought to pray at least as often as we eat. We need the Lord. In our modern era, many people, especially in the West, they resist eating bread in order to be uh, healthy or to lose weight. But this verse is not about praying for a gluten-filled world, okay? It's about praying in dependence upon God, that if God doesn't provide for us, we will not be provided for. Now, in ancient days, in fact, the audience that heard Jesus first speak these words were people who worked for a daily wage. They would work, and at the end of the day, they would be given their wages for the day, and that provided for them for that particular day. And then the next day, they had to go and repeat it again and again. So therefore, if they were sick or they couldn't show up to work, if they didn't get their daily wages in some way, they were in genuine danger. But yet we today, so many times, because we have so much of an abundance, we forget that ultimately it, we have that abundance because of God's abundant blessings to us. Give us this day our daily bread. There are indeed many people in this world, unfortunately, who face the challenge of food insecurity, and God blesses us here in such a way that we're abundantly provided for, and therefore we should be a blessing to others. God blesses us to be a blessing to others. But whether we choose to acknowledge or not, it's very important that verse 11 points out to us the fact that we have because God provides for us. James 1 puts it this way, every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father above. God provides for our needs. And to, to pray, give us this day our daily bread, is to acknowledge our dependence upon Him. We need Him. He provides for our physical needs. But let me very quickly point out something very important. This petition teaches us to pray for bread, not cake. In other words, this is about our needs, not our greeds. We are to pray for our necessities, not for luxuries. It's significant that Jesus instructs us to pray for something as basic as bread. And in so doing, he is bidding us not to be addicted to the things of this world. We live in a culture that insists that within us is a spirit of greed and worldliness and materialism and overindulgence. And we are ungrateful people, so much so that when I stand to read a verse like this, many of us think, God give us daily bread. We got plenty of that. We're ungrateful people. We do not know sometimes even what it is to tell ourselves no. We always have, and we always want more than we have. And in the process, it's easy for us to forget God. This verse is is offensive because it's humbling. It's also offensive because 
It calls us away from pursuing prosperity. Give us this day our daily bread. You see, Christians should never desire anything that would tempt us to forget that we need the Lord. So Jesus insults our desire to be big shots by telling us that we need to pray for daily bread. It means that Christians should never desire to be rich and wealthy or beyond others. We pray for daily bread because we depend upon the Lord. We need to learn how to be content with what we have. To pray for bread is to remind us that the abundant life Jesus offers is not health and wealth. It's a relationship with Him. And when we have that, we indeed are rich. We're to pray for bread to acknowledge no matter where we live, we need the Lord. Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9 puts it this way, Remove from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. You see, Jesus is teaching us here in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. He is teaching us to live that way, to pray that way. This petition asks us to keep God in his rightful place, our place of dependence upon him. Are you living a life of dependence upon God? I love birthdays. Do you love birthdays? I love birthdays. I don't love them as much as I used to because they tend to make you acknowledge certain facts in your life. You with me? Recently, very recently, our nation had a birthday. July 4th is a birthday celebration for our nation. You probably know that on July the 2nd, the Continental Congress gathered together and they passed a declaration of independence and in the process, a, a document drafted by several Virginians, Thomas Jefferson being the head of the list, the Committee of Five, drafted the Declaration of Independence from England. And while we celebrate the birth of our nation and its independence, we need to be very careful that we don't have an independent spirit ourselves from the Lord. He says here, give us this day our daily bread. Are you living a life of dependence upon God? Are you? Or have you declared your independence from Him? You see, prayerlessness, a lack of prayer is a declaration of independence from the Lord. Sporadic church attendance, that's a declaration of independence. Moral choices without consulting God's Word, you know what that is? That is a declaration of independence from the Lord. And I would encourage you with great haste to repent, seek the Lord's forgiveness, and to change your behavior. To pray, give us this day. Our daily bread is to acknowledge our dependence upon the Lord, but also it is to affirm our confidence in the Lord. Give us this day our daily bread. When we pray that, we're saying God is able to do just that. It, this prayer, to pray this, is a statement of trust. When we pray this petition, we are affirming that God is ready, willing, and able to supply whatever we need. That God is able to help you get and to keep a job. That God is able to heal your body. That God is able to mend your broken relationships. That God is able to give you wisdom to make the right decision. That God is able to protect you in dangerous situations. This petition teaches us to take our needs to God in prayer and to trust Him that He is able to meet our needs. We need to learn to pray this way. Lord, we need you. We depend upon you and we're confident that you can meet our needs. And when we approach God, we need to do so with confidence. Notice how he says it. Give us this day. This day speaks of the fact that we are to confidently trust God. We do not pray that God would give us bread for tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. We are to be concerned about today. As we pray specifically about today, we are expressing our confidence in God's faithful ability to take care of the rest of our days. 
You see, Jesus did not instruct his followers to pray for a one-time permanent solution to their daily needs. He did not tell believers to ask for enough money to forever guarantee that we would be able to feed our families for days, weeks, and years. The point Jesus makes here is to pray with dependence upon the Father, but also confidence that God can do it. I mean, think about the Israelites as they wandered. What did God do? He provided manna for them each and every day. In teaching us to pray about this day, Jesus is introducing the point that he will deal with later on in this chapter. When In verse 25, he says uh, of this same chapter, Matthew 6, 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life and what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and your body more than clothing? And then he goes to point out how the birds of the air God provides for them and the grass of the field that he clothes them in such beauty. How much more will you, made in the image of God, how much more will you be provided for by the Lord? Don't worry about tomorrow. Instead, trust him. That's what we're praying when we do this. We're coming to God in confidence. Philippians 4 puts it this way. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God will take care of you. And when we pray for our daily bread, give us this day our daily bread, we're expressing dependence upon the Lord, but also confidence in in him, that we can lean upon him, that we're confident that he will meet our needs, that we confidently trust him. My wife and I just recently celebrated at the end of May our 30th wedding anniversary. Congratulations to me and sympathy to her. I get it, all right, I get it. We celebrated that just a few weeks ago by going to the West Coast. We traveled up Route 1 on the Pacific Coast Highway from San Diego up to San Francisco. and Part of that journey, we stopped at the San Diego Zoo, which was amazing. And in the San Diego Zoo, we saw an African Impala. Not the Chevy car, the animal, okay? The African Impala is a part of the antelope family of animals. And and they, you might be amazed to know that they can jump 10 feet high. And they can jump for a distance of 30 feet. But the amazing thing to me that got my attention is the fact that the African impalas in the San Diego Zoo and in any zoo were in a cage below ground level with a three foot high wall. They could have easily jumped over that wall and to escape the enclosure, but they, but they don't. You know why? The African impala will never jump unless they can see where their feet will land. And I wonder if sometimes we aren't that same way in our daily lives. We won't jump unless we see where our feet will land. We will never take a a chance unless we're sure what's on the other side of it. The Lord asks us when we're praying, give us this day our daily bread, that we would be confident in him. But also, notice he says, give us this day our daily bread. We're not just to be confidently trusting God. We're to be constantly trusting God. Daily means that we're to regularly and repeatedly come to God trusting that he is able to meet our needs. Have you ever worked for a company or a business that one day had to close down? You ever had friends or family that you went to because you had a need and they couldn't help you? Well, I thank God for the fact that God never has an account that's closed due to insufficient funds. That we have a friend who's never broke and who can always help. That God is in a business that will never be in danger of closing. God is able, ready, willing, and able to meet our needs. Philippians 4 puts it this way. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Are you living a life of confidence in God? 
Are you? Give us this day our daily bread. Do you pray that confidently? Do you live a life of confidence in God? Because I'm here to tell you, from my own personal experience, sometimes I find that worry lines on people's faces sometimes is a vote of no confidence in the Lord. Dust on your Bible, that's a vote of no confidence in the Lord. Your need to control people, situations, and everything. You know what that is? That's a vote of no confidence in the Lord today. God is giving you an opportunity to repent, seek his forgiveness, and to change your behavior. God will take care of you. Because you can depend upon him and you can be confident that he will meet your every need. I'd like, like to thank my friend H.B. for telling me the story of William and Sevilla Martin. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of them. William Stillman Martin and his wife Sevilla years ago were a, a traveling family. William Martin would preach the gospel in open-air meetings. His wife Sevilla would play the piano and they would often share with people in all kinds of different ways. And this particular time in their life, they spent several weeks at the Bible training school in upper New York State. The president of the school had invited them to prepare a songbook for the school. And while they were there, Reverend Martin, Mr. Martin, was invited to a speaking engagement that was some distance away from the school. He'd have to drive some distance to get there. And he was preparing to do so, and when he arose on Sunday morning, he realized that his wife, Sevilla, Sevilla was ill. And he began to tend to her needs, and in the process realized that she wasn't going to recover right away, and he was concerned about traveling, and so he had a discussion with his wife. Someone years ago said that uh, marriage is the art of constant renegotiation. Well, they were having one. And as they were discussing whether he should drive some distance away to this speaking engagement or should he stay home and take care of Sevilla, their young son overheard this whole discussion and he spoke up. And he said, Dad, you know, we read about this in our Bibles and we talk about this. Don't you think that if God wants you to go and speak at the church that God will take care of mama while you're away? Duly convicted by his own son, Mr. Martin got in his car and he drove to that distant speaking engagement. And as the morning continued, Sevilla did indeed begin to feel better. And echoing in her ears were the words of her son, and she sat down in her bed and wrote the words to a song. And when Mr. Martin returned, he put that song to music. And it ended up in that song book. And you and I have sung it many times before. You may not recognize it. It's more than 100 years old. Here's what she wrote and what we have sung many times. Do not be dismayed, whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. Through days of toil, when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. No matter what may be your test, God will take care of you. Lean, weary one, upon God's breast, God will take care of you. Give us this day our daily bread, we read. It's a statement of dependence, acknowledging our dependence upon the Lord, but it's also a statement of faith. And I wonder, is that your statement of faith today? Can you truly say that you are at a point in your life where you indeed do trust and believe and act on the fact that God takes care of you? You see, Jesus came and lived a perfect life. And he gave that life for his children in such a way that Jesus serves not just as an example or a great teacher 
or a great leader. Jesus is our substitute. In fact, the gospel could be easily summarized in this way. Jesus in my place. Why? Because God takes care of us. Thank you.